Scatter class, in this video, we're going to be looking at bivariate data and scatter plots. The learning intention of this video is we're going to understand the bivariate data looks at two separate variables in a given context. We're going to know how to draw scatter plots to compare these data from these two variables. And lastly, we're going to be using um, these scatter plots to describe the correlation between the two variables using key vocabularies. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you guys that at the moment, currently up to date, we've been looking at unit variate data and these examples include like histograms, dot plots, stem leaf plots and box plots. And they're considered to be unit variate data because we're only really looking at one single variable. And what we generally do in these types of graphs is we just measure or record the frequency. OK, so as you can see along um, this particular image over here for my particular histogram, this is the variable I'm looking at the scores on a final exam. And what I'm really doing is I'm recording this, um, its frequency, and I'm grouping them into these class intervals as you can see in a histogram. And each graph will obviously do this a bit differently. Um, and what we've been doing so far is we've been, we've been actually describing these dis distributions in terms of its shape, in terms of its spread, as well as its center. And we said that for shape, it could either be symmetric, positively or negatively skewed. We said for spread, we could be looking at the standard deviation, the range or the IQR. And for center, we've been looking at um, the mean, median and mode. What we're going to be looking at now is something referred to as bivariate data. Now, you remember uni over here. Uni is a prefix which indicates one, so one single variable. Whereas bivariate data, so bi um, is a prefix which indicates two. So bivariate data actually looks at two different types of variables. And what we generally try to do is we try to see whether there is an actual relationship between these two variables, okay? So for instance, if you look at my um, graph up, up above, um, I'm looking at to see whether there's a relationship between the weight and the height of a child. Uh, whereas this one over here shows um, a graph that maps out the relationship between the number of ice cream sales versus the temperature in this case. So as we said beforehand, a bivariate data includes looking at data for two separate variables in this case. And these variables that we look at are generally related to one another. What I mean by related to one another is that often one variable uh, from the two is going to influence or affect the outcome or the values for the other um, variable. And these variables are defined as your independent variable and your dependent variable. And I'm hoping that you guys are very familiar with these two terms because these terms should be um, you know, explored and unpacked in your other subjects, such as science in this case. But if you don't really understand what I mean by these two terms, I do have the definitions over here, okay? So we said that the independent variable is a variable that kind of changes or influences the dependent variable. And we always represent this along your x-axis. In contrast, your dependent variable is a variable that will be affected and is dependent a lot, uh, on the independent variable. And this is always going to be represented along your y-axis. Okay. Now, this is really important where you actually map out your independent variable and dependent variable because this is going to kind of affect your, um, your answers, to, especially in later lessons where you need to find the equation of a line of best fit. But let's ignore that for now. But in order to guys help you remember where you need to plot the independent variable and dependent variable, um, what you need to know or what you need to um, kind of see is that I can kind of draw a D along the Y axis. So in this case, this is going to represent your dependent variable, whereas I can kind of write an IV if I kind of rotate it along the X axis. Okay, so this is a little shortcut here um, that will help you remember where you need to be plotting your dependent variable versus your independent variable. What we're going to be looking at now is what scatter plots are and scatter plots are these visual displays that we use to illustrate the correlation between two variables. Okay. And as I said, I'm kind of repeating this many times throughout today's lesson because we need to, I need to make sure that you guys understand this independent variable always on the X axis, dependent variable always on your Y axis. And when you draw or yeah, when you draw a scatter plot or construct a scatter plot, what you do is you need to show each individual point represented either by a circle or a cross um, on the scatter plot. And I've included this in brackets because we generally don't um, show the individual points as a cross, but occasionally you might bump into one, but it's usually going to be um, circles in this case over here. As you can see by my first dot point, I did say that the scatter plot is used to describe the 
um, or used to illustrate the correlation between two variables. And I'm going to discuss in more detail what this word actually means. So the word correlation or association um, are two pretty much synonyms that you could use in replace of the word relationship. So these words are just used to describe um, how these two variables are all related to one another. And when you're discussing about the correlation between two variables, there are three main criteria that you need to address when describing the correlation. You need to talk about the strength, the direction, as well as the form. And I'm going to go into a lot more detail in the next few slides what I mean by this. Now, when I'm talking about the um, direction, I'm talking about whether it's going to be positive or whether it's going to be negative or there is whether there's going to be no correlation at all. So when something is positive, it means that when you increase in the X variable, that means your Y variable must also increase as well. That's what a positive correlation will look like. In contrast, a negative um, correlation is when you increase along your X axis, notice that your Y values keep decreasing over here. So as, as a result, this is referred to as a negative correlation, whereas a no correlation is where it doesn't really go up or down. It's just kind of random in this case. So as a result of this, there's no trend at all. So please note these three terms over here to describe the direction of a correlation. Generally, the textbooks don't usually refer to it as the direction, but um, in year 11, year 12, they will be referring it in terms of the direction though. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about is the strength of a correlation. And where we're trying to describe the strength of a correlation, we're either going to describe it as being weak, moderate, or strong. Um, and there are two ways that we could actually identify the strength of a correlation between two variables, but these two methods are relatively subjective, meaning that when I think something is strong, you might interpret it as moderate instead, okay? Um, and the one of the ways that we could actually identify whether um, identify the strength of it is by examining the density of all the data points. So we're looking to see whether they're close or whether they are far apart from something we refer to as the line of best fit. Now, I haven't really just defined what this line of best fit is, and this is something we're going to be looking at in more detail next lesson. But the line of best fit essentially is an imaginary line that we kind of draw on a scatter plot that helps to summarize um, the main trends, okay, in the actual scatter plot itself, okay. So it's an imaginary line that kind of summarizes pretty much like the average of all values in, um, in this case. So anything that's close towards the line of best fit, then it's going to have a strong relationship, whereas anything that's kind of further away is going to be um, weak and moderate is therefore going to be like the midway point between these two and as a result as you can see over here it's quite subjective to say um, to classify whether something is strong and moderate I find it's personally a bit difficult um, so therefore I won't really be taking marks if you if you think something is clearly um, moderate uh, because as I said it is ambiguous so and another way that we can interpret um, the strength of our correlation is by looking at its gradient. So what I mean by that is looking at the steepness of the actual line of best fit. And generally, something with a, a steep line of best fit means it's going to have a strong, uh, strong correlation. But I need you to be looking at these two definitions and seeing which one is um, matches the best description. Um, now, what I have here as my last top point is the strength of a correlation can be accurately determined by calculating Pearson's correlation coefficient. However, this is something that we're not going to be doing at all, but we, you will be doing this um, again in year 11 and year 12, and you re will require a CAS calculator in order to do this. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of like describing the, um, the correlation of uh, between two variables is the form and essentially all we are doing is identifying whether the correlation is going to be linear meaning a straight line or non-linear so as you can see on the left hand side this is linear because if you draw a line of best fit this is going to be a straight line whereas if you notice on the um the graph in the middle notice that it starts to curve up and because it's curving up this no longer follows the straight line, so therefore it's considered to be non-linear, so not straight. And this is also an example of a not straight um, correlation as well. I also want to talk about what outliers are, and we talked about outliers being um, data points that don't really generally fit the usual pattern within the data set itself, and they are often very distant, as you can see over here. So this, these two values are considered to be outliers and if I also draw the line the best fit it would be something similar to this and I don't really try to accommodate for the outliers at all because they don't usually fit in the general trend of the actual data set. Um, 
Looking at my last top point, I said, unlike box plots, there's really no mathematical method or way for you to identify what the outliers are because generally these outliers are quite obvious. So you just need to pretty much eyeball them. What we're going to be looking at now is describing the correlation between the two variables on a scatter plot. So previously, I did say that there are three criteria that you need to address when you're describing the correlation, and that was the strength, direction, and form. And I know that some of you guys actually struggle with these word descriptive uh, responses. So in order to make your lives a bit easier, I've provided you guys with a template and all you really need to do is just to select the correct um, response in that to write down your answer. So for instance, you just need to select from the correct strength, identify the direction and as well as the form as well. And what I have up here, the X variable, and Y variable, if um, a context is given, so if it's talking about like, for instance, temperature and sales, and you need to actually include that where the underlying parts are going to be. Let's now look at an example to see how we could actually describe the correlation between two variables. So what I have over here is a graph that shows um, temperature and the number of ice cream sales, okay? And we know that temperature should be along the x-axis because temperature being the independent variable will affect the number of sales um, for ice cream sold. So that's why temperature's x-axis says is going to be along the y-axis. Now what you need to do is describe the correlation in terms of the strength, um, the direction as well as the form. Now in this case over here, to help us determine the strength, what we're going to do is just draw an imaginary line of best fit to help guide our answer. So our line of best fit will look something similar to this, okay? And once we do this, all we need to do is measure or look at how clustered and how close the points are towards the line of best fit. In this example over here, you would also agree with me that most of the, um, the data values are pretty damn close to the line of best fit, so therefore this indicates a strong relationship. Notice in this case over here, as temperature increases, the number of sales that, you, that you've made also increases, therefore this indicates it's going to be positive. And in this case over here, we can see clearly see that this is going to be a linear relationship. So if I was to write my answer, this is how I would write it in terms of using the actual template itself. So the scatter plot suggests a strong positive linear relationship between temperature and the number of ice cream sales made. All right, class, now I want you to have a go in terms of describing the correlation for this particular example. So please pause this video right now and have a shot at describing the correlation between the price of a bag and the number of bags sold for this particular scatter plot over here. Now, if you've done this correctly, what you would do generally to help um, guide your answer is you would first try to draw an imaginary line of best fit so you can see how close the points are towards the line of best fit. In this case over here, the points are kind of close. So I wouldn't say they're very close like our previous example. So therefore, I would use the word moderate to describe the strength of this correlation. In this case over here, notice that as the price of a bag increases, the number of bags sold doesn't increase at all, it kind of decreases over time. So as a result, this is an example of a negative relationship. And we could also see this is going to be quite linear as well. So the way I'd answer is, is the scatter plot suggests a moderate negative linear relationship between price of bag as well as the number of bags sold. We're going to be looking at the last part of today's lesson, which is about drawing scatter plots. And there are a few guidelines that will help you draw your scatter plot accurately. Firstly, remember, as I said, our independent variable must always be along the x-axis. The dependent variable must always be plotted along the y-axis. Now, this third point is very, very critical, but you need to ensure you, that your intervals are fixed and consistent. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean that when you go up these values over here, the increment when you go along the x-axis or when you go along the y-axis, they need to go up by the same amount. So in this case, it keeps on going up by 10, goes up by 10. So the scale is pretty much consistent. In this case of here, although the scale is not going up by 10, it is going up consistently. So it is going up by plus two each time. And this is really critical when you're drawing your scatter plot. Lastly, this one over here is something that most people often forget to include. And I've said that the zigzags are usually um, used along the X or Y axis when we're skipping numbers on the axis. And I'll show you what I mean by this later on. So firstly, uh, I wanna just talk to you guys about some of the common mistakes that I often see students make. So um, the first mistake that I often see is that students often put the numbers in the data set along the X axis as their class intervals. So for instance, if this was your data set over here, they just put directly, this is you're gonna be 40, 42, 47, 40, 53, and so forth. And notice that the reason why this is incorrect is because that this scale over here, okay, this 
kind of looks like one centimeter. This goes up by two, but for our next one over here, this goes up by five. This is inconsistent, so therefore this will automatically be incorrect, okay? Um, so please be wary of this common mistake so that you don't actually make the mistake. So if you were to do this correctly, then um, notice that I'm actually going up by five now. It's now consistent, and this is the way that it should be. Not only that, but notice that I'm um, from here to here, obviously this doesn't actually go up by plus 35. So what I need to do is include a little zigzag, as I said in my previous slide, uh, when you're skipping values. So that's, that's when I'll be using the little zigzag just then. The second common mistake that I often see is that students often include to label their X and Y axis, and you're always gonna be missing out a half a mark each time. And this is a cumulative, because there's generally a lot of scatter plots usually on your test. So in order to avoid this mistake, please always check back on your drawings to see that you've labeled your X and Y axis. Units should always be included as well, if appropriate. Um, and lastly, um, the third common mistake that I often see is that students often connect each data point together, which is incorrect and wrong because this is no longer going to be a scatter plot anymore. All right, guys, we're going to be looking at one particular example over here before I get you to do the textbook questions, okay? So for this particular example over here, it wants us to firstly dr um, draw the scatter plot. So if you were to draw the scatter plot, the first thing that you should be doing is ensuring that you use a... Um, you, you label your X and Y axis, which I've kind of already done already, but also you need to um, include the appropriate class intervals. So this is gonna be my class intervals for my X axis. So notice over here, uh, my smallest value is two, my largest value is gonna be 17. So I'm using a class interval that's rather appropriate. I'm going up by twos each time. You could go up by fives, but that would only give you like three groups in this case. Um, and that's probably, probably not as appropriate. So um, try to have as many as possible. So I'm going up by two in this case. And for my Y axis, I'm going up by one each time. Now, once you've identified the appropriate class interval, all you really need to do is plot this. So the way that you interpret it is you read this as a coordinate. So in this case of here, you read this as a coordinate, read this as a coordinate, read this as a coordinate and so forth. So therefore find where 13 is along the X axis, that's gonna be around here, and then go up by 2.1. If you've done this successfully, then it should be over here, okay? For next one, nine, four, so that's your next coordinate. So this should be plotted over here, and do the same thing for each of them until you've drawn the whole thing, okay? So this is what your scatter plot should look like. Now once you've um, constructed your scatter plot, you can now answer part B and part C, but I'm gonna be answering part B and C collectively by using the template. So if I was to do this, um, what I'll do first is I'm gonna draw as um, a line of best fit so I could see what the strength is gonna be. In this case of here, notice that your points are kind of close to the, along the lines of best fit. So I'm gonna say it's gonna be a strong negative linear relationship between X and Y in this case. And lastly, for part D, I just need to identify the outlier, which in this case of here is gonna be this one, to, um, to identify or state the outlier, what you need to do is state the coordinates for this particular outlier, which in this case was going to be this one over here. So I'd, I'd say 6, 0 0.9 in brackets when you're trying to state the coordinate is going to be an outlier because it doesn't really follow the general trend of the... Um, All right, guys, what I'd like you to do right now is I'd like you to please answer these five textbook questions um, either in your exercise book or on the PowerPoint slide. Both have their pros and cons, obviously. So if you did it on your PowerPoint, I've actually provided the actual um, grid lines, the templates just to make your lives a bit easier. But obviously, if you're plotting each individual point, that's going to be a bit more time consuming and less efficient if you actually did it on paper. But obviously, on paper, you would have to graph and rule up your scatter your grid lines are pretty much essentially. So obviously it's up to you how you want to approach it. So um, for instance, as you can see over here, I provided you guys with the actual grid already. And all you need to do to answer part B and C is you answer it in these boxes over here. Part B and part C, again, try to use a template so you can answer it collectively. And for part D, just state the outlines in terms of the coordinates. So answer questions one, answer questions two, um, four, as well as six and eight. Um, and if you've done this successfully, then this is the um, these are the solutions that you should be getting. This is pretty much the end of today's video. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys again in the next video. Bye.